Hi, this is David Walensky of Don't Die, bringing you another interview from the audio archives. This time I'm bringing to you the first half of my conversation with Margaret Heffernan, an author and entrepreneur. We spoke on November 25th, 2015. If you'd like to read a full transcript of our conversation, you can check the link in the description below. And also below, you'll see a link to my Patreon where your support helps me continue with this project. Thanks. Okay, so my name is Margaret Heffernan. Um, I currently reside in the UK. I work in the US and the UK. And among the many things that I've done, I've written a book um, called Willful Blindness, which looks at how companies full of smart people manage to make gigantic blunders. And in the course of writing that book, um, I became very interested in, if you want to go right back to the beginning, to kind of how do we how do we decide what we believe is true and what is not true, and what might be the working conditions that impede our judgment. And one of the things that clearly impedes our judgment is um, fatigue, stress, multitasking, uh, many of the things that, in fact, characterize today's working environment. And, mm-hmm. um, and so I was really interested in how bad can this get, <laughs> and that led me to look at the class action suit, which was brought against uh, Electronic Arts some years ago because of their reliance on really extremely long, intense working weeks of 70 to 80 hours a week. Mm-hmm. And um, and it's sort of, I mean, at least in academic circles, it's well understood that you know, bigger teams and longer hours doesn't necessarily yield greater productivity. But that news didn't seem to have reached Electronic Arts. And they were basically building schedules that assumed that people were working in crunch mode really as a norm rather than as a crisis. Yeah. And, um, and that's really, that's what led me into... Um, looking at the gaming industry in particular. Now, I should back up and say I spent eight years running software businesses in Boston, Massachusetts. So the creation of software was not um, a new topic for me. Uh, but working people in under these conditions, that was definitely a revelation. So what is the uh, – what's currently – making the business world uh, burn right now, or what are the sorts of problems that you're focusing on right now? Well, I hate to say this, but this whole issue around working hours and working conditions um, continues to be fairly critical. Um, I'd love to say that, that you know, having drawn a lot of attention to it, the problem had gone away, but it really hasn't gone away. People still cling to this belief that more hours equals more output. Um, yeah. So that- just a gigantic amount of evidence to suggest otherwise. But that, you know, and multitasking continue, sadly, to be pretty critical issues. Um, I think more recently than that, I wrote a big book about how competition doesn't really deliver the way that we think it does. And, um, And in that respect, what has become clear is that creating very competitive environments for people to work in, uh, which many people used to think would mean that people were spurred to do their best work. Uh, that appears not to work either. Um, <laughs> and one of yeah. the things that we're seeing right now is that a lot of the systems and management processes that were established to make people more productive, so things like um, annual appraisals and forced ranking, um, those things are being dismantled because they turned out not only not to make people more productive, but often, in fact, to inhibit productivity because they made people compete with the people that they were supposed to be collaborating with. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, like, when it comes to, you know, really long hours and these sort of expectations, like um, a, a developer in the game industry told me that, you seldom see programmers working on more than two hardware generations, and there seems to be a revolving door where people come in young, really enthused, and then get sort of spit out, bitter, and yeah. in their thir- in their thirties or, or uh, maybe in their forties. Um, 
I mean, do you see this in other industries or are there ways that industries can try to fix this if they want to? This like, um, it seems like there's not really much interest in sort of building talent with legacies. I think that's a, a, a very interesting observation. Um, I think the way I tend to think about it yeah. It is not so much about um not uh, not so much in terms of deliberately burning people out, which I think it's clear some companies do do. Um, yeah. but the failure certainly to nurture talent and also a kind of misguided belief that the way that you keep teams of people really creative is to keep swapping them around all the time. So mm-hmm. there's this, this instinctive belief, because it's definitely not rational in the sense that there's no evidence to back it up, but there's, there's an instinctive belief that if you want to keep a team thinking fresh, what you have to do is change its um, membership frequently. Now, again, if you start studying this with any kind of rigor, what you discover is this is exactly wrong that uh, teams of people tend to become more productive over time, partly because they build levels of trust which allow them to think more freely. Mm -hmm. Uh, But still we tend to think that what you want for maximum creativity is fresh blood. And if that were the case, then burning people out wouldn't really matter because you'd have to get rid of them anyway because they wouldn't be fresh anymore. So whether you get rid of them when they're old blood or new blood, it doesn't really matter because you want to get rid of them. Now, again, I I have to say, all of this is wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Which is to say, it's not borne out by evidence. Um, You know, there's a ton of evidence that shows people actually get better at their artistry over time and not worse. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it may tell us something about lack of patience, lack of faith, lack of investment in people. And I also think that it reveals a really fundamental flaw in our thinking about management, which is if you think, well, we'll just burn people out and replace them, what what is the mental model that underlies that? It's a manufacturing model. It basically says that, you know, all work is like a factory in a factory, some of the pieces get worn out. You throw them out and get new ones. Um, I think that manufacturing mindset in the digital age is a pretty disastrous paradox. Yeah, I mean, you use the word uh, creativity, which I have uh, something I've come to just sort of notice and accept about um, the game industry. And when I say that, I refer to the the big companies, the big publishers. You know, um, budgets have gone up by a factor of 10 each hardware generation since it started. I mean, it's in like the tens of millions now. Um, It it would seem like that would be (laughs) not sustainable for the uh, foreseeable future, but I've just come to sort of see that I don't think that these companies are necessarily creativity is the goal. I think it may just be um, people at the top trying to trying to keep their employees uh, employed and with with health insurance and benefits. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so to me, the interesting thing about that is that might sound fine, but it is a creative uh, yeah. field. But it's but its labor force is largely invisible to its audience. So right. when I talk to when I talk to people, they talk about big budget games as if they are a renewable resource just sort of bubbling up in the Oh that's really interesting. So I mean like I asked some of my, my developers like that, that I talked to for this, like, you know, what are things you feel people are willfully blindful of in the industry? And someone did remind me that like, yeah, they they forget that people are making these things. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that's right. I'm absolutely sure that's right. Yeah. yeah. I think people often forget that people make software. <laughs> of all kinds. Yeah. But I mean, I'm sure you know, if you know about Gamergate, that like oftentimes the audience for video games can be pretty abusive and, and mean to... Even if it's not the person responsible for the quote-unquote mistake, just 
anyone in the crosshairs that they can get. I mean, is that unique to video games? Hmm. I don't know. Um, like, I think maybe it, politics is the, is the, I think politics is the only other field where that happens. Well, I think, I mean, I think we've become pretty mean you know, <laughs> as a generation. If you think about, you know, kind of monstering on Twitter, for example, you yeah. know, that's a kind of public discourse that shows a level of meanness that certainly strikes me as a pretty recent phenomenon. Now, I mean, you have to avoid being too romantic about this. After all, in medieval Europe, you could get put in the stocks, and that was pretty mean too, right? So, <laughs> so human beings are cruel, and we like to think that we're not, or we like to think that we've got better over time. But I think, you know, I think there is a fundamentally cruel aspect to human nature, which we do like to ignore or at least think isn't us. But, you know, history would suggest it absolutely is us. I think the difference is that now with something like a video game, you can reach so very many people. And so it's not just that I'm being mean about your game, or my next door neighbor is being mean about your game. I can now, thanks also to social media, I can monster, I can put, pull together a really large number of people and the effect of our being mean about your game is much greater. And so I can create a very unpleasant mob quite easily. I mean, with much greater ease than ever before in history. <laughs> and so so it's much it's easier to do, it's cheaper to do, its impact may be visible to more people for longer than ever before. So that's pretty tricky stuff because I may not really spend much time or effort thinking about its impact on you. I'm just kind of happy to do it and when I'm sick of it I can walk away from it. I don't necessarily have to take any long-term responsibility for it. But if it's your game, you know that's a very big deal for you. So I think no. I think we have the ability to be abusive with greater impact for longer on more people than we've ever had before. Well, I mean, and certainly, like you said, with the stocks. I mean, but also like these sort of verbal harassment. That that's nothing new but the sheer intensity and amount of it and the ability to focus it is new but I mean like I talked to a psychologist for this project a few weeks ago who told me at least based on what she studied that a lot of the sort of behavior we see online is misfiring survival instincts but if that is true, I mean, like, what what do you, I don't know if you agree with that, but I am curious, like, if that's true, then, like, what are we really hunting and gathering when we're online? <laughs> well, I think your question is a very good one. I mean, I think, I mean, that suggests that the, that the, the sort of behavior you're seeing is a threat response. I just don't understand what the threat is. Right, because if it's if if the argument were true that it's about survival, then I would have to feel to be prompted into this kind of action. I would have to feel that my survival was somehow at risk, and I can't see what's at risk in these situations. So I'm not sure I buy that. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I do either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there's a, you know, there's a really awkward thing that happens, which is when you can see that you might acquire quite a lot of notoriety by creating one of these digital mobs, um, then there is an attraction to do it that may be greater than the offense you purport to decry. Mm-hmm. So there may be more in it for me to be publicly horrible to you than there's ever been before. In the past, if I said I didn't like your stuff, well, people might agree with me and they might not, but I didn't necessarily gain anything from my opinion. 
Now I may gain as much notoriety as you have. Mm. So I think that's a different... Then I think you're into a different ball game, so to speak. So you think it's is it much more about identity than survival? I think that's exactly the right word. Because I think that one of the problems that we haven't quite fessed up to is that now that I'm aware that I'm one of 7 million people, 7 billion people, now many of whom are online, um, I think that what, it, you know, what it, the threat response is about is my sense that I'm absolutely meaningless. And in that respect, um, creating notoriety for myself out of my unhappiness with you <laughs> might reasonably be described as a threat response. So, I mean, what's what's missing here? Are we missing additional ways for people to reinforce their self-identity online, like beyond just posting st- selfies? Or Well, I think actually what's <laughs> it's a desperately unfashionable conclusion to come to. I, <laughs> I think what's missing is a certain amount of humility yeah. and a kind of lack of interest in difference. You know, that that actually the world is, does have 7 billion people in it. And um, and that's, you know, apart from the ecological burden. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean I have less. And, um, and I, think it, I think what we're missing is my capacity to tolerate the fact that those other 7, million, uh, 7 billion people, they matter just as much as I do. And their presence doesn't diminish me. In fact, it's what makes the world so interesting. Mm -hmm. So I I think what we've lost, in a way, is our sense that other people are just as important as I am. Do you feel that? I mean, that that people are measurably more mean? That is sort of that is sort of a through line of a thing that's really hard to measure and that I ask and like I, I did speak to another author who wrote about the net wars of the nineties, which is just when people were starting to get on the internet and having to deal with people that they normally wouldn't run into and and she did seem to recall a time where at least in like nineteen ninety four where someone called a SWAT team on, on someone else. But if you pay any attention to the video game space, that's sort of like a routine prank to do like that's the new the mm-hmm. ordering ordering 100 pizzas um but i mean is that something you feel or have noticed like are people sort of less nice to each other online i i think what i would say is something slightly different which yeah is, um i think it's much more about um what i think of and write about as the rise of narcissism which is um, there is a great deal in our society which puts enormous pressure on individuals. So our whole education system is about individuals. Uh, Most of our reward systems are about individuals. Mm -hmm. Most of our social structures these days are individual rather than communal. And I think the net effect of this is um, that it makes individuals start to think very individualistically and that necessarily creates a much more narcissistic outlook and uh, there's a psychologist named Jill uh, I think it's Jill Joan Twenge who's mm-hmm. written about this in, at great length and, and much more eloquently than I'm wishing on about it <laughs> um, you know and her view is that because we put people under so much competitive pressure to succeed, to be beautiful, to be rich, to be talented, to have prizes, blah, blah, blah. And since most people fail this test, um, it's, our threat response is basically either to attack or to cheat. Now, I'm very interested in the argument that it makes cheat because I think that explains a lot of the behaviors that I'm seeing. Uh, mm. But essentially what she's saying is that in highly, highly competitive environments, um, if you can't succeed, as it were, the right way, so if you can't win the game by playing by the rules, 
then you're going to start trying to win the game any way you can because winning matters so much. Now, you could argue, and again, I'm not sure I would because I think this is a little simplistic, but you could say that people who are very engrossed in video games may have a propensity to measure themselves pretty much against quite competitive lines. And if that's the case, then you're dealing with a subset of people who are intrinsically pretty competitive characters. Um, then their sense of threat might be greater than average, which might explain why you're seeing what you're seeing. So in other words, so the simple way of putting this is just to say, these are pretty fragile egos, and when yeah. they're not boy or boy, do they strike back? In other words, you found yourself a hypersensitive market. So, I mean, I have this theory that I haven't really voiced to a lot of people in my interviews, but I think you would be a good person to run this by, which is I, I sort of just get a sense from last year that the game industry is sort of afraid of its own audience. It it sort of is stuck in this position of, you know, do they, not that it's that easy or that simple that there's two sides, but they risk, um, they risk offending, you know, people who think games are supposed to be a certain way if they, if they go against that and if they don't change, they'll offend other people. But something that's been really interesting and something that I've not read anything about but been able to get through some of these interviews is that as Gamergate was going on, um, a couple different people at some very big game companies told me they didn't feel like work was the appropriate place to talk about it. So nobody talked about it. Mm, that's I'm curious really interesting. To, yeah, I'd be curious to hear your response to that. Well, hmm. It just wasn't the place to talk about it, is what they said. Yeah. Well, so I think what interests me about that is when I was running my software company in the States, um, one of the many things that happened in that era, if you like, mm -hmm. is, was the Monica Lewinsky scandal. And one of the things that really puzzled me about that scandal which otherwise actually wasn't that interesting, to be honest. <laughs> no. <laughs> it happens every day. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we have another sex scandal. Who knew, right? Um, yeah. But one of the things that was really interesting to me about it was I observed that nobody in my company ever, I never heard anybody talking about that at work. And what um, it sort of struck me as odd is that in the UK, where I used to run a company, um, people would definitely have talked about it. So it made me think, well, why is nobody talking about this? And the conclusion, for better or for worse, that I came to was that they were so afraid that they would disagree with each other that it was easier not to talk about it. And I think, in a strange way, this brings me back to something we were talking about before, mm -hmm. which is, I think, as much as we really wanted this not to be the case, that what the Internet has done, quite in, unintentionally, is instead of broadening people's horizons, it's narrowed them. It's allowed us to find people who are tremendously like ourselves and cleave to them. And when I say this was not what we intended, you know, originally in the early days, she said, <laughs> sounding like an ancient lady, uh, but in the early days, what we thought was, isn't this cool? I'm going to be able to collaborate with people in Brazil and Russia and Spain and all over the world, people that I've never met, and I'm going to have access to Peruvian poetry and music from Ghana and my whole life is going to be so much richer than it was. And of course, theoretically and technically, that's true. But what we discovered was that that wasn't how people used the internet. What people did is they found they used it to find people just like themselves. 
So the, God, the people who loved Ghanaian music got together, and the people who loved Brazilian poetry got together. And instead of broadening their taste, they narrowed their taste. And, of course, what this does is it makes our taste not just more narrow, um, but it makes us as people more clannish, more convinced that we're right, less interested in people who disagree with us. And what we've seen is um, that far from broadening our thinking, it polarized our thinking. And you can see this for it is dramatically represented in the polarization of American politics at the moment. Which is people, you know, people are not anymore looking for uh, diversity. They're looking for echo chambers. And they're yeah. finding them more easily than ever. And when they find those echo, echo chambers, their views become more insular, not less. And I think, you know, so much in the gaming, in the gaming world is a form of community building. So what you're finding is more people who think the same way, making each other more extreme. Yeah. I'm actually, uh, in a perverse way, glad Donald Trump is running because he is a good way of illustrating uh, what is happening in a lot of video games. Right. Um, for people. <laughs> um, but, I mean, you wrote about some of that um, in, in, in your book, Willful Blindness, which I guess was 2011, right? Correct, yeah. So so your your mind hasn't changed about that, but what does come to mind is that you wrote about um, Pandora and a lot of different ways the technology could ostensibly broaden our horizons, but that's not what it's really, like, good at doing. Like, I think you used the example, like, you may like bands like the Goo Goo Dolls and also Chopin, but it's not going to recommend one from the other category based on the other. That's right. So, I mean, what, is, what does that say <laughs> about us and what we expect from technology? Like, are, are we just expecting, are we being just lazy with our use of technology? Like, it's kind of our fault that we're narrowing, right? Well, it is kind of our fault, but I think it's also, um, it's also human nature, which yeah. is we tend to like people who are like us. And we always have. So this is why, for example, you know, we have always been attracted to people who look like ourselves. Right. Um, you know, we're overwhelmingly likely to, to choose as our life partners people who are the same height, eye color, hair color, body shape, all that kind of thing. And if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, this makes perfect sense, which was there was more safety mm -hmm. in that kind of affinity. So in some, so I don't think the phenomenon in and of itself is brand new. I think mm -hmm. what's just incredibly disappointing is that the technology we hoped would disrupt that ended up confirming it and exacerbating it. But I think too what 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 happens is I don't know if either of these things are on your radar, but I look at things like like um curved televisions or the fact that we're bringing back virtual reality once again like I think another, I think I think another thing not being said is that I think consumers have gotten really bad at demanding actual innovation. Yep. Yep. I think that's right. It was really interesting. I was at Google the other day and I was talking to a young engineer there. Yeah. And I don't know quite how or why, but we found ourselves talking about virtual reality. And he was saying, oh, you know, maybe this time. And I said to him, has it ever occurred to you that people just don't want it? <laughs> <laughs> Did you actually say that to him? Yeah. He said, and he just, you know, basically his response was, but they ought to. <laughs> But I don't think it works that way. No, it doesn't work that way. But so, I mean, you're I mean, basically, I... basically oh, go ahead. saying, you know, if we think it's a good idea, then sooner or later we will succeed in shoving it down people's throats. So, I mean, what can people in the video game audience try to learn from that? Or, like, what are ways they can demand innovation? Um, 
Because people say this thing in the game circles about like, oh, they're just going to vote with their dollars. In other words, they're not going to buy something. But what that sort of is forgetting is that their dollars are going to be someone else's dollars. They're just going to take their place. It's not really going to mean they're going to be heard. No, I think I think that's right. I mean, I think it's really interesting, you know, that that many many people, as you know, really significant and serious artists, did have a high expectation and hope that the video game industry would be the art form. Mm-hmm. And I think there are many people who still think that it could be, but that it's been kind of, um, I don't know, disrupted or at least distracted <laughs> by e- easier, cheaper ways to make money. And, you know, and I think that people who really love the industry find that incredibly disappointing. And I think the only alternative is to say, well, if you really still believe in that, then you have to go off and prove that it's right. But it's the same thing as the Google engineer where, again, virtual reality is being pointed to. This is going to, this is going to fix everything. <laughs> it's yeah. sort of like, it's sort of like outsourcing the, the human responsibility for creativity to hardware. I think that's right. And I think, you know, if we've learned anything and, and we may well not have, right? <laughs> <laughs> correct, correct. <laughs> it, it should be that nothing fixes everything. You know, that the only fix is yeah. is to keep working at it. And the only fix is about diversity, not homogeneity. And there isn't going to be one fix for any of these things. And we, one reason we have such a deeply crappy um, political system at the moment is because we keep thinking that there are going to be quick fixes, but mm. there aren't. You know, we have to so, kind of fall. We have to fall out of love with oversimplification. What's that going to take? Oh, I don't, no. <laughs> I, don't see that, I don't see that taking hold anywhere. I mean, maybe in some pockets, but by and large, no, I don't see that. I hope so. Well, I hope so too. But we're probably going to have to screw up more than we already have first. <laughs> That's probably true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, I'm curious as it pertains to, you know, sort of human-created systems rather than hardware of, of game companies. I mean, how do you perceive through their orthodoxy that they create systems that sort of bury talent from, uh, pardon the cliched phrase, out-of-the-box thinkers? Well, I think I think most companies that I know well um, suffer from many, many misapprehensions about what talent is, what it looks like, how it behaves, how you identify it. Mm -hmm. I think we still have a lot of very romantic ideas about talent as um, a sort of unique, God-given attitude that a few people have and most people don't have. I think that's almost entirely wrong. I think some people are better at some stuff than others, but I think what really interests me at the moment is the degree to which actually almost everybody's creative unless or until you stop them. And I think in businesses, we're often quite good at stopping them. Um, mm. So, I, I, you know, I, I, think, I, think, I don't think we have any kind of creativity shortage. I think we have a shortage of understanding about what creativity looks like and feels like and needs. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is a beautiful article um, written some years ago about Bell Labs and what made Bell Labs so exceptional. And people like to think, oh, it must have been that somehow they got all the best people. Right? They somehow had this unique <laughs> ability to choose yeah. the super talented and unfortunately, the magic algorithm got lost, right? But it's still out there somewhere. And if you could just find it, then you'd know how to identify a super talented person and hire them. And I don't think there's anything I've read that suggests that that mythology is true, which doesn't stop people believing it. Um, I think that actually almost everybody has a capacity for creativity and it's really much, pretty much the job of companies and managers and people whose business this is 
to get the best out of people. Um, but most of them don't have the patience. They just hope they can find the superstars. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how much you pay attention to the game industry and its output, but it, it does seem to indicate from its output that creativity does not seem to be necessarily the goal. In fact, like there's this sort of there's like this stupefying conservatism where you would think people would get tired of the same thing over and over again, but they don't. And uh, another theory that I have is that's sort of because because things stay so narrow in video games from the industry, like, you know, kids start when they're young, then they age out, and because right. like, nothing cha- nothing changes, and so it's sort of this cycle that keeps repeating, um, but but what's weird is, like, why, why are these employees and the workforce that is often forgotten about, like, what are the things you perceive in software or what you know of game companies that keeps them from actually pushing to do something different? Well, I think what's really extraordinary is the degree to which um, a lot of people want something better, but they don't feel that they have the capacity in themselves to yeah. create the thing that they want. And I was, I mean, it's interesting. I did a speaking engagement in London yesterday. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and it was basically full of quite young people saying, you know, I hear what you say, Margaret, but, you know, what can I do? You know, if my <laughs> boss has been interested in my ideas, what can I do? And I said, well, you know, first of all, how hard have you tried? Well, you know, he's not asking for my ideas. Well, no, he won't ask for your ideas. Why would he ask for your ideas if you're not trying to do something with them? So, I, you know, what I observe is a sort of stalemate which is bosses say to me, my people don't have any ideas. And their people say to me, my boss isn't interested in anything I have to offer. So this is, uh, as they say, a failure of communication. (laughs) It's it's the failure of the bosses to ask, but it's also the failure of the employees to risk talking about what really matters to them. Mm-hmm. And there's, I would say, a huge amount in our education system that has a lot to answer for in the sense that um, it doesn't really teach anything meaningful about sharing or risk-taking or coming up with your own answers. What it teaches us is that there is a right answer for everything, and the successful people are the ones who get it first. But that's mm-hmm. second guessing, which is a really different thing from actual creativity. 